Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Sanjeeva. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I I uh, am CTO, but then again, I'm I held the program chair for the. Uh, uh, conference, so I would like to personally thank all the speakers uh, to delivering excellent uh, sessions, and uh, uh, I think uh, we bug you a lot, and we'll bug you again next year when we uh, have the uh, WSTCON uh, 2025. So uh, it's really hard to come and give a keynote after two great uh, keynote uh, keynotes delivered by Kate and Frank, but. Every last dance has the potential to be the best. Okay, I'm not telling it's the best, but there's potential. Okay, so uh, I think if you are a basketball fan, you know who these guys are. So this is Michael Jordan. I believe he's the best basketball player. Uh, and then that's Pippin, who played with him. So during the conference, uh, a lot of people ask what it looks like being the CTO of WSO2, and how you feel. So my answer to that is, I feel like Pippin. And you can imagine who's the goat, and <laughs> John. Okay. So then next question, people ask, uh, how you get there, and what you should I do to become a CTO? Then I think there's no cookie cutter approach. It can uh, differ from organization to organization. But I would say my advice is get a really good mentor like Jordan. So I was really lucky to have Sanjeeva as a mentor. And then before that, uh, Paul Fremantle, our founding CTO. So my advice is get a really good uh, uh, mentor. So get into the uh, story. So I think uh, uh, first day, Lisa spoke about uh, dark matter, dark energy. And this is a really interesting uh, topic for me as well. So this is how I started uh, learning about uh, this stuff. And uh, when Lisa was speaking, I was uh, referring all the things that I read from uh, this particular book. Um, I'm sure you might have read the book or watched the movie, but movie is crap, I think. Uh, you had to read the book. And uh, it, it explains a lot of these stuff like dark matter and uh, black holes, uh, all these things in a really nice way. And one interesting thing, the author of the book, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, he used to live in Sri Lanka, where my roots are coming from as well. So uh, I think uh, Lisa spoke about uh, dark energy, dark matter. So I'm uh, going to uh, take a few other stuff on the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular subject. It's about the galaxies. And then when we are uh, looking at the galaxies, I can map them to the cell-based architecture as well, because uh, the collection of cells creating systems, so similar to the galaxies. And then the uh, solar system contains components, or the planets, and uh, there's a, uh, it, it kind of orbits around a center. So similar way, in the cell-based architecture, you can find cells, that there's a cell gateway and number of components inside the cell. So that is how this particular architecture style uh, created. And, and I think there are a bunch of uh, sessions we had, and uh, you might have attended to those sessions and have a really good idea about cell architecture. But I'll tell a little bit about uh, uh, this architecture style and how it started. So um, I authored this thing with uh, our founding CTO, Paul Fremantle, uh, because those days we were working on uh, iterative architecture style, and then we identified uh, this is a really good uh, way to uh, put a, a reference architecture, and then how you can build modular systems. And what we did, we wrote this paper. So when 2018 we released, the feedback I got was like this. Are you smoking? I think uh, uh, it's natural. And some of you might uh, question from me as well during those days. It's really complicated why we need something like uh, cell architecture, because microservice architecture can uh, handle most of the stuff. But uh, uh, even that was the feedback I got. If you look at today, it has become a really trending architecture style. I think there are parallels to cell architecture. So one example is DOMA, or domain-oriented microservice architecture. And then there's another thing called uh, my, uh, mesh 
uh, oriented architecture. So uh, there are uh, like that different parallels created by different organizations, and some gave us credit, some didn't. So we released the paper under Creative Commons. Uh, so, but then again, since it's useful, I think people copied it. So that is uh, uh, what we can see as the trend. And there's a connection between cell architecture and domain-driven design, even during Sanjeeva's keynote. Sanjeeva explained that. So basically, uh, at the beginning, I didn't like domain-driven design. I read this blue book, and uh, it explained uh, domain-driven design uh, mapping to object orient orientation. So it didn't click me well, because the stuff that we are doing today is completely different from object-oriented um, uh, concepts. So then I, when I was presenting uh, the cell architecture in one of the conferences, because after releasing the paper, got invited to present this uh, concept in many technical conferences. I think it was uh, Nori KPIs. Uh, so one of our customers uh, walked to me and said, this looks like domain-driven design. Then I told him, OK, I don't like uh, domain-driven design. Then he asked why. Then I said, I read this book, and it doesn't uh, make sense to me. Then he said, don't read uh, that book. Go and read uh, Vaughan Menon's books. I think, Vaughan, you are here somewhere. Uh, so I started uh, reading Vaughan's book, and then uh, uh, kind of found a synergy in between domain-driven design and cell architecture, and identified that uh, a way that you can define the boundary of the cell can directly um, take from domain-driven design, and you can map a domain to um, a cell or a subdomain to a cell. So Vaughan did a boff yesterday, and he said, uh, domain-driven design is not cell architecture. Then I would like to tell cell-based architecture is not domain-driven design as well, because uh, domain-driven domain design is a one way of defining the uh, cell boundary. And if an organization required to uh, define the, domain, uh, the cell boundary in a different way, still they can do that. But um, the domain-driven design is a really good way to uh, divide the complex systems into small chunks. And I think uh, uh, some of the organizations, they follow this uh, uh, Conway law and identify the communication pattern of the organization and define domains. Even at WSO2, uh, uh, we, when we uh, started writing, rewriting our internal applications, we follow domain-driven design and map them into cells. And it is not an easy exercise because uh, uh, there can be a lot of uh, complications, as well as uh, you have to uh, find uh, the correct domains based on how the communication happening inside your organization. So the, uh, uh, the, in summary, what cell-based architecture is delivering, it's about the modularity and composability. So if you attended uh, uh, the, some of the product sessions, especially Corio, it is a reference implementation of cell-based architecture that when you create a <coughs> project inside Corio, it creates a cell. And when you uh, uh, create a number of projects and build a system, it gives you a clear uh, cell uh, collection of cells and give this architecture diagram as well. So the composability and uh, uh, the modularity, so the composability comes with the other capabilities we are providing inside Corio, like the marketplace, developer portal, so you can discover the capabilities that you are delivering from these cells inside the product. So then the advantages you are getting from this uh, architecture style, uh, it's many. Uh, it's a few things I listed here. First thing is the structured agility that you are getting, because you can change the capabilities um, uh, quickly, since the, uh, there's less dependence between the other uh, components. So you can have that agility in your architecture as well as the <coughs> implementation. And then you can have proper versioning of your components, Again, it connects with the first uh, uh, capability, the structure agility, so you can keep on uh, releasing these new capabilities without uh, worrying too much. And then there's a dependency management, because especially 
when it comes to uh, a distributed architecture like um, uh, microservice architecture, there are many moving components. So now uh, the, uh, the dependency management becomes a really challenge. I think uh, early stage when Uber uh, started writing the microservices, they published something called a Death Star diagram with many um, microservices and many connections, and it was really hard to identify what are these connections and how you can manage each and every component. So based on this uh, particular approach, since you are grouping these small units or the components, uh, you can easily do the dependency management. And then it gets auto-wired as well, because uh, you can have a, a, a concept like a service mesh within your uh, cell, and you can wire these components without uh, worrying too much. And the reusability is high, because each and every cell exposes an API, so you can uh, reuse the capabilities and uh, build applications, and it's self-contained, as well as, as a concept, it's technology neutral. As I um, explained, that we have implemented it with Corio, but if somebody follow the uh, specification, they can implement it with, uh, by using other technologies as well. So, the, uh, so that's about the technical advantages, but um, there's a human aspect to this as well, because people write code and people build systems, and it is supporting uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the way the current development happening, especially with uh, two pizza teams, how these development teams are organized. So uh, cell architecture providing that foundation for them to operate in that particular isolated mode. So there are many advantages, uh, advantages a team can get <coughs> by following the uh, cell architecture. The first thing is about the mastery, because now they are focusing on one domain and building these components, so they can provide um, a lot of capabilities, and uh, they can focus on that particular functionality within that large system and keep on improving that, because their focus is that. Then the second advantage is the autonomy. So that is a problem. Even you theoretically uh, have these uh, two pizza teams, if there is no autonomy, then they can't operate uh, independently. But with this cell architecture now, they are building these things in these small units, so they get a lot of autonomy, and they can operate within that particular uh, group. And I think there are uh, a lot of technical challenges inside enterprises, but what we see is more than the technical challenges, there are a lot of political challenges. So having that autonomy will help them to uh, face that and then use the technology that they would like to uh, use inside that particular implementation, the programming language that they like to uh, use in that particular implementation, and have that proper autonomy when they use a concept like this. Then the third uh, thing is the purpose, because now they have a proper purpose, because they are focusing on one capability, and they are building on that, and they can have a proper purpose and deliver it to the organization. Uh, so that way, the uh, output will be really productive, and they can uh, give more and more value to the uh, organization. Then I will switch the gears and touch based on the, uh, one of the concepts uh, Sanjeev explained during his keynote about the business platform. If you go back to the platform, a diagram that uh, he showed. Basically, you have the digital experiences at the top, and then you have the business platform. Uh, as he explained, that's the uh, value or the differentiators an organization can get, and that's where the value creating for the organization. Because it's really important to understand that, that the technology platform is not providing much um, competitive advantage, the business platform is where that the organization is getting more and more advantage. So I had this diagram <coughs> for a while to explain this in detail, that different level of abstractions, and you can see the deployment abstractions coming from the uh, 
infrastructure level, and on top of that, you have this business abstraction. That's where you build things on top of the uh, deployment abstraction layer that you have. So that's the fun part, that you write uh, services, and then uh, you kind of uh, uh, create different type of uh, functionalities, workloads, and then as a result, it starts providing uh, these uh, capabilities as an API event or a data for the application development groups to build applications. And top of that uh, layer of APIs, events, and data, people come and build applications. So that's how these things are connected, and that's a, a detailed view of what this uh, uh, business platform looks like. And then the, another uh, way of looking at this business platform, business platform is basically the SDK for the business, basically creating capabilities uh, or functionality that the business can use and build applications. So that's where the business, business uh, platform layer coming and playing a role. So, but end of the day, it's about value, right? Because you have to uh, keep on creating value, like uh, even you write an API, even you write a service, you create a database. If it doesn't uh, provide value for the organization, uh, it doesn't have a, a, a purpose. So basically, uh, the whole purpose of that business platform is keep on feeding into the value stream. So uh, some organizations, they are doing this properly, but uh, some of the organizations, they are only focusing on that uh, technical layer and not focusing on the uh, value. So understanding the value stream <coughs> and then keep on adding value to that particular uh, value stream is what we have to do. And then that way, the stuff that you do, like the services you write or applications that you write will start generating value and uh, provide more uh, productivity for the organization. And that way, the, the team uh, who is building this application will be a really valuable team for the organization, not become a cost center, rather than it becomes a value center. But this is a kind of a um, problem that industry um, stuck at the moment, how to understand the value, how to uh, uh, make uh, or deliver more and more value into the organization. So I started a small parallel project with one of my friends. I think, Gautam, you are here somewhere. So, so Gautam Palapa is the, um, he's the SVP of the digital strategy at InnoMind. So he's working like me with many uh, organizations on uh, these digital transformation projects. So we had a chat about this, and then uh, we thought, OK, we should find a way to uh, uh, define value, and then how technology can connect with value. And we uh, found a nice way of representing it. We call it as uh, octopus. Uh, two reasons. One, octopus got uh, eight hands. And uh, that particular model, we identified eight uh, uh, um, value streams, and then uh, I think it's a very intelligent creature. Still, we are not done with that, so we are planning to release this in winter, just a, a preview for you. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to highlight, identifying that value is a very important thing when it comes to uh, building digital experiences as well as digital systems in your organization. Then uh, how you can, now we spoke about platformless from day one, and then uh, we identified what are the uh, raw materials or in in ingredients to build uh, a platformless uh, experience, but how we can get more from it and how we can go beyond that. So that's where the product stack coming. Uh, if you are planning to build platformless, yes, we have the foundational technology, coming from API management, integration, and identity access management. You can use those foundation technologies and build your um, platformless experience. If not, if you want to quickly um, access it or take it as a service, then that's where the internal developer platform coming and playing a uh, role there. So you can just sign up and start 
using the uh, internal developer platform that we provide that we call Corio, and then get the uh, platformless experience and build your business platform on top of that. So that's the product side. And in addition to the product side, I think uh, the community is very, very important. So we can share knowledge and we can collaborate with uh, you uh, while we are uh, delivering these capabilities from the products. So we do many stuff. On top of that, uh, recently we started a new initiative. So uh, we are doing a podcast, as Sanjeev and I started a podcast. It's called the uh, Discovering the Architecture Middle Path. So why we call it as the Discovering the Architecture Middle Path? Because there are sometimes uh, you can't just stick to one uh, side of a problem. You need to take a deep understanding and then find the middle path because you have to balance the technology as well as um, business needs and based on that decide what, uh, what's the correct decision and what's the uh, um, path that you sh uh, should take. So that's why we call it as uh, uh, architect in the middle path, architecture middle path. And um, uh, we have done seven episodes. Uh, still, I think uh, we are uh, getting there and we are planning to improve a lot. And we spoke about many topics, including platformless. So we have our podcast in uh, YouTube, uh, Spotify, as well as Apple Podcasts, so uh, we, are, we will continue uh, this thing, and then we are planning to uh, put a new episode every uh, month uh, based on our schedules. And in addition to that, uh, there are more, there's more we can do, uh, how we can collaborate with uh, each other. One thing is this architecture exchange uh, programs that we do, that uh, we can sit with you, look at the current architecture, and then uh, work with your architecture team and identify what the future architecture should look like and then have a proper uh, roadmap how you can get there because you can't just change everything overnight. And, uh, uh, but we can have a proper plan with you and help uh, to improve the architecture. The next thing is uh, most of the developers and especially tactical architects, they like to have these meetups. And if you have a meetup in your organization, uh, we are happy to contribute with you and then come and share our knowledge in those meetups. And some of your organizations, you have this um, kind of an internal TEDx type of uh, uh, events. So uh, we are happy to come and do a session on various topics. I think you have identified uh, already during this event uh, the things that we can share with you. So uh, we can pick a topic and uh, work with you closely and uh, deliver uh, a session inside your organization. And then uh, in addition to that, as an advisory role, uh, we can uh, help you with the digital strategy. It's not that just uh, work with you and provide a uh, document. I think most of the consultancy firms uh, uh, deliver that type of a document, and sometimes even they uh, forget to replace the customer name. I have seen that. Uh, so it is not about that document. When you have that document, how you can deliver? Uh, the, the, the things that describe in that document, so we can work with you and then have a uh, do advisory uh, role. And if you have a digital steering committee or something like that, we are happy to take a seat on uh, that type of uh, initiative. So uh, I think uh, that's it. So in Sanjeev's session, he took a, a quote from Steve Jobs, uh, but I'm finishing this with one of his quotes because for most of us, he's our Steve job. And um, so he said, there's no end game, and we are in an infinite game. So I think this will answer some of the questions that you had with uh, WSO2 version 1 and WSO2 version 2. So that's about it. And I think Simon Sinek, he, uh, had, he, had, he has a similar quote as well. What he's telling, uh, winning is kind of uh, uh, one milestone. Uh, the most important thing is be in the game and play in the game. Okay, I think uh, uh, that's it, and uh, thank you very much.